to uh, be on Zoom together. And uh, I'll just keep on talking and whatever happens, <laughs> I'll not stop. Uh, so it's a great blessing to be with you in person today. And uh, lovely to see so many people in the building. And uh, some old friends there at the back. It's great to see you. And in the middle, and just to let Terry and knows that I'm still there, friends. It's good to see you as well. <laughs> at the front row as well. To, it's uh, more than t two years since I last spoke here. And um, um, I think I've spoken to you on Zoom uh, a couple of times or attended some Zoom activity. Uh, I've been in so many Zooms. Uh, I don't know where I've been Zooming to or Zooming from. And uh, in fact, it's the fastest I've ever moved. Um, <laughs> in point of fact, we're reading um, and doing some stories uh, on standing firm in the book of Daniel. And we're in Daniel chapter 3 uh, today. And we'll be thinking about three very brave guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And those who have Bibles, um, you know, open that Daniel 3. Uh, if you have an app, open up there as well. Uh, we'll be reading through the passage in parts and also sharing together. But uh, one of the things we need to realize is that we can't really grasp what is happening in chapter 3 and to remind ourselves what has happened in chapters 1 and 2. So very quickly, um, Daniel and his friends have been realized or they've been co-opted by uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to be members of the National Civil Service. Uh, they've become members of the running of government. I don't know if you realize that, uh, but that's what they had. Their skills and their talents were in their gifts were such from God that they were in the highest place of the government of Babylon. It wasn't a particularly nice government. In fact, from what we read in chapter 3, dear old Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a mad person, really. The number it mentions in time, he is furious, he is furious, and he is furious, I fear for his blood pressure. I you know, almost expect him to keel over at any moment because of his ag aggressive response. In fact, Daniel so surpassed in wisdom and knowledge from God that he became the head of the civil service in Babylon, only second to the king himself. These are serious people in serious places in the heart of an empire. This is them. And in chapter 2, we find Nebuchadnezzar waking up very, 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 very excited at a dream he'd had. And he had this cunning wheeze. I've got this dream in my mind. I'm going to get my chief advisors not only to tell me the meaning of the dream, but actually tell me the dream itself. Now, I sometimes wish my wife would do that. <laughs> you know, she wakes up and wants to tell me a dream. You know how it is, and you listen attentively. I wish you'd just say, Doug, you tell me the dream, and uh, I'll have a quiet three minutes together. You know, Be because the astrologers and astronomers and um, people couldn't tell them what the dream was, he decided to get rid of that branch of the civil service, kill them all. That was his practical policy. Daniel and his friends prayed, and as they prayed, God revealed to Daniel what was happening in the future for the king. It says, O oh, king, you saw a great statue, and that statue prophesied four kingdoms. First your own, then the Medes and the Persians, thirdly the Greek empire, and finally a future empire of Rome and its might. And then Nebuchadnezzar does something very odd. He's so struck by this dream in chapter 4. He's so struck, so struck by this dream in chapter 2 of the statue, he goes and builds the statue. Isn't that amazing? And then he puts himself at the top of it. And my wife Barbara is a better reader than me, for she comes from Lancashire, I come from Yorkshire. She's going to read the first um, six verses of this passage. Thank you, Barbara. So yeah, chapter uh, 3, starting at verse 1. 
King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Jura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, you can come again. Bless you. That's great, isn't it? That sets the scene very well. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is saying these verses, he's not saying, don't worship your God. He says, you can worship your God privately. But I want you to do is worship my God and my God publicly. It's a command to do that when the music plays, when the uh, musicians make a noise, you get your heads down, your bottoms up, and you worship this God. And then there's an indu inducement. If you don't worship God, there's going to be a bonfire in Babylon, and you're going to be the feeding of that bonfire. An inducement. Worship this God and be an idolater before this God. Now, we don't know how many people were on the plains of Jura. If you've got a big plain, it's probably a big area of people, and it's probably hundreds and thousands. It was a public event, a national holiday, a festival to the worship of this mighty statue. Um, but as they were bowing down, three people were standing up. As everybody went down when the music plays, three people stood to face the music. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then they, they had telltale enemies in the government. They had telltale enemies. At this, verse 8, it says, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. These are the very same people that God had saved through Daniel. These are the very same people who God had kept from being killed because of Daniel's dream and interpretation. And you notice how they keep saying, you, O oh king, you, O oh king. They know, really know how to crawl, don't they, these people? It says, you, O oh king, may you live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever does not fall down to worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon. It's almost crawling to him and then at the same time blaming him. It's you who did this, Nebuchadnezzar. You set them up. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. But they pay no attention to you, O king, your majesty. They will neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. These are very brave guys. We don't know where Daniel is at this moment. He's certainly not present. He may well have been in another part of the empire, serving uh, the king at this time. But it's three men who stood firm while everybody bowed down. Their God told them they could only worship the Lord their God alone. They were not going to bow down to this worshiping of this image. For them, this was idolatry, idolatry. 
They could have chosen some very simple safety strategies at this point, which would have enabled them not to stand firm, but to bow down. They could have reasoned like this. And I wonder if sometimes we have used these safety strategies when we've been called to stand firm, either at work or among family or among community. They could have said, we'll take the strategy of respecting where we are. They could have said, we're visitors. We are exiles. We must respect the local practice of this king. They could have taken the strategy of obedience to avoid obeying God and standing firm. They could have done this. They could have said, Nebuchadnezzar is our king. He is the king of the empire. He is the one who has called us and employed us. We must obey him. So we will bow down to the, um, to the idol. They could have played what I call or think I'm not calling the crossed fingers behind my back strategy. You know, I'll bow down with my body, but I won't bow down with my heart. They could have used that as an escape strategy from doing what God wanted them to do. They could have used a strategy not of crossing their fingers, but saying to themselves, well, it's not a big thing, just this once, just this once. God will forgive me for bowing down. But these guys were not going to do any of those things. They were not going to give any of those strategies. And I'll add one or two of my own strategies in. Strategies I use to avoid standing firm for Jesus. I don't want to put people off Christianity by seeming too forceful, too strong. Or maybe we'll milk it down a bit and water it down. I really don't want to put myself on the spot. That's what it's about. It's not about embarrassing non-believers. It's often about me being exposed to be embarrassed myself. Shadrach, Meshach and Abagnego was having none of this. What I like about these guys' response to when the king is told, verse 13, furious with rage, first outburst, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach? You know, you've got to really read these stories with a sense of madness and humour, isn't it? These are really very, very strange. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? He knows the answer. He's been told the answer. That you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now when you hear the sound, and he goes through all the list of the musical instruments, he got everybody to train for months to play these instruments. So they all wanted a name in the list. He says, but if you do not worship this Im uh, idol you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue from you from my hand? This is power politics, isn't it? This is a king saying, I have the ultimate power over your life and your, God, your death. And not only do you have you in my hands, but there's no God in the universe that can save you from my hands. That is tyranny, isn't it? That is force. That is telling them. But I love the way that these men don't shake in the presence of power. I would, you know. I would. I say all sorts of things to my friends and um, family about what I would do if I was in this situation. But when we get to the bigger matters, if we were dragged into the presence of some very forceful, powerful person, how would we stand? Well, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego have two approaches. And it's one of faith in God and one of realism about faith in God. Faith in God and real realism. They say effectively, God can rescue us from you. 
You have met somebody more bigger than you, Nebuchadnezzar, and he is the Lord God Most High. He is the ruler of the universe. He is Lord of all. You have got a job interview to get into that position, and you have failed it. That's what they're going to say to him. Not quite in those words. But he can deliver us. But even if he doesn't deliver us, we have these words for you. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not defend, need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Verse 16. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us. But if he does not deliver us, we want to you to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What was the source of their strength in this situation? These were captive people. These were oppressed people. These were people who owed their future and their very life to a person who could take it at any moment. These were those who served this king. Well, firstly, they realized they didn't serve this king alone. They served the king of heaven alone, first and foremost. And that's one of the things we need to always remember wherever we are in our lives in our neighborhoods, in our working environment, in our places of responsibility, in our places of service, we're not primarily serving people. In those situations, we're serving God in serving those people. They knew that one with God was a majority against all the forces of anyone. They had this faith, this confidence, this knowledge that God could rescue him. But also the knew that if he didn't rescue them, they were not going to bow down to this dictate of idolatry and idolatry in their lives. We have a choice always, don't we? Whether we'll be conformed to this world or be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We have a choice whether we'll be dictated by the pattern of this world or be dictated by the image of God, which God is creating in us. And we have to make the choice that this people have to make. God will either deliver us, or he may not deliver us. In the book of Acts, there are two telling examples of this principle of trusting God in faith for deliverance, and then trusting God in the fire of suffering. Trusting God in faith in the deliverance is in the, in the chapter 12 of Acts where Peter and um, gets put in prison by Herod. Herod discovered this weeds that if he killed leaders of the Christian church, people voted for him or thought he was very good. He did it with James and killed him and thought he would take now Peter to have him executed. And so the whole church got on its knees to pray for the deliverance of Peter. And they prayed, and they prayed, and prayed right throughout the night. And while they were praying, Peter was a slave, uh, chained to some guard in the dungeon, waiting to go to heaven next morning. He finds an angel in the cell with him, prodding him. Wake up, Peter, it's time to go. And what's more, I'm Yorkshireman, and I've got the keys, he says. And he leads him out, into the, out of the prison cell, through the prison, into the courtyard to visit the people who are praying, who don't believe that God has delivered them from the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the miracle. That's Peter. God can deliver us. But in chapter 7, there's another gentleman who is a deacon of the church. He's a man full of the Holy Spirit. He's a man full of giftedness. That when he prayed and preached, people got healed and people got saved and people trusted this God of heaven. And this person was arrested. And this person was put on trial. And when they said to this person, now Stephen, defend yourself, he didn't defend himself. He told the leaders of Israel where they were going wrong for the last 400 years. That's not a way to win friends and influence people. And so the first matter of the church, trusting and believing that God could save, 
said, I will not bow down to this, and he was stoned to death. Faith and realism. Faith and realism. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego says, God can deliver us. He may not deliver us, but we will not bow down to your force, your anger, your rage, and your threats. I just want to draw a close connection between a bonfire in Babylon and a bonfire in Rome. So one of the things you can do with this passage in um, Daniel chapter 3 is read 1 Peter chapter 1 because they have very similar themes. In AD 64, the Emperor Nero started a fire. He wanted to build and rebuild Rome. And so in order to rebuild Rome, rather than getting the demolishers in or apply for planning permission, which the Senate were not giving him, he simply burnt big sections of the city down. This backfired upon him because he got blamed for it initially. And he says, it wasn't me. It was those people called Christians. And what's more, I'm going to sort those people called Christians out who were a new sect of Jewish followers of Jesus the Messiah. I'm going to sort them out and I'm going to start persecuting them. And he did this by rounding up the leaders of the church in Rome. Two leaders of the church, soon after the AD 64, a gentleman called Peter and Paul. One of them got a merciful beheading because he was a Roman citizen. And the other one was crucified. But before he was put to death, Peter wrote this letter. And he wrote these words. As Rome was burning, he wrote these words. He says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is going to come to test you. This fiery ordeal. It's not in Babylon now. It's in Rome now. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. But rejoice so that you may be overjoyed when this glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. This is what Peter's doing. He's saying, warning you that these things may come. They may come in your time. They may come in your life. They're coming to us. They will come to you. He's writing to scattered Christians who were on the run because of persecution. The fiery ordeal as Rome burns, the fiery ordeal as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego face their torment. What about the fiery ordeals we may face when we may have challenges? Well, the fiery ordeals can be different things, can't they? Obviously. The fiery ordeal that we've been through for the past two years as a community, as so churches, but also as a nation as well. We've been through some very, very strange months and strange times. Some people during that time have been through the fiery ordeal of mental health and depression, not being able to cope with the changes that they've faced. If you've been in there, that has been a fiery ordeal for you. Some people have been through the fiery ordeal of using their, losing their jobs, testing their question, where has God has been in this time for my family, for my home, and my situation? Peter says in 1 Peter 1, he says, all these, we rejoicing though for a little while, we might have to suffer various kinds of trials. And these have come so that the genuineness of your faith may be proved of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it is refined by the fiery ordeal, that you may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is being revealed. There may be fiery ordeals in our lives, but there may come a time when the Christian church in Britain joins with the Christian church across the world in suffering for the faith of Jesus. Wherever 
those believers, brothers and sisters, whether in Asia or whether in some parts of uh, the Middle East or even in some parts of our own country, stand up for Jesus and suffer for him. That may happen more widespread. But Jesus says there is a promise in this. There is a promise. The promise is that God will rescue us in it, through it, and by it. The king became more furious. This is his second heart attack, his second recourse to stress pills. Verse 19, then the king became more furious when Meshach and Abednego and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter and had them thrown in. And as they descend into the furnace, and as, they, as the king go down to the mouth of the furnace to see and watch his people get toasted, he sees not three people, but four people. What was the promise in this furnace? I don't know whether the king gets excited again and says, oh, let the fourth person in. I only said there should be three people in there. I don't think he said that. But he counted one, two, three. And one who looked like the Son of Man. That's an unusual phrase, even in this point for the Old Testament. The Son of Man was here, the representative of the humankind, but also representative of God kind as well. He knew this one was a divine being from heaven. And what is the promise that these men have in the face of their intense suffering? The promise is, I will be with you always till the end of the earth. Those were the words of Jesus, weren't they? You know, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever you go, whatever you do, I will be there first, and I will be with you always. This is a visual demonstration of the presence of God in among his people. God will be there. Their faith can believe that he will rescue. Their faith is realistic. It recognizes he may not rescue from the situation, but the promise is there. I will be with you always. We only go wherever God sends us. Wherever we are, God and Jesus is present with us by his spirit. This is an amazing thing that God promises each of us. At the beginning of the pandemic, I've got a bit of a history of closing places down, it turns out. Um, at the end of February, I was speaking at Warwick Christian Union um, at one of their CU meetings. I was finishing off a series on what, uh, uh, two Thessalonians for the Christian unions there. I didn't realize that I was going to end up finishing off the whole of the CU because everything was closed down within a week after that event. I apologized to them when I came to speak to them a few weeks ago, just before Christmas, um, I apologized and promised not to close them down again. And it worked, it didn't, <laughs> bless them. But this is what happened with these men here. At the beginning of the pandemic in March 2000, uh, uh, 2020, just as everything was closing down, um, my daughter-in-law rang me uh, she was one of many nurses, many brave nurses at Warwick Hospital, Walsgrave Hospital, who had been called to um, support the response in the national health to care for people caught with COVID. They were dealing with an unknown disease at that point. Hundreds, indeed thousands of people were dying per week at that point. And uh, her family were very concerned because she'd been called from general duties to, uh, like many other nurses and doctors, to in uh, ICU uh, care and intensive care unit and response units. And they were telling her, Mum, don't volunteer for it. Keep safe. Keep your family safe. Keep yourself safe. And she rang me up, knowing um, I was their father-in-law and a minister of a Christian church, so she wanted spiritual guidance 
about this. She said, I'm praying Psalm 90 where it tells me that God will protect me. I believe as a nurse I should be involved in the intensive care unit and at the front of this. And she asked the question, will God keep me safe in this situation? And uh, I didn't say this immediately. I listened for quite a while. <laughs> and we talked together and uh, we prayed together. But in the end, I said to her, I said, God has trained and called you for this role. And you should be saving those in need. God may keep you from COVID or he may not. But know this, that God will be with you. He'll be with you in those you serve, in their caring, and through you, he will be with your colleagues as well. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you, is what Jesus says. And for these months, her and many other people throughout the two years have known this reality that through their care, they have cared for others and served God in those places. Because there is no point in creation, no when they're in the whole of creation, where God doesn't say, that place is mine, and I am present wherever my people are. So, this is the story of Daniel and his friends. And the king is over the top again. I think he's a wonderful over the top character, isn't he? You know. He says in verse 28, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was just about to kill them half an hour ago, wasn't he? Who has res sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in defi and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the peoples of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego should be put, cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubbish for no other god can save in this way. I think he's only got half the message, hasn't he? Really. <laughs> This God who rescues, this God who saves, this God who redeems is not a God who goes around wanting to destroy people. He's only got half the message. But dear Nebuchadnezzar is on the way. Dear Nebuchadnezzar is learning what it is to watch the people of God in order to himself to become a servant of God. And then he promoted Shadrach and Amigo Abagnego in the province of Babylon. Well, so you can't even get yourself sacked from this government according to this lot. I'm still serving God where I am. And that's true of you. Whoever you are, are serving God. Not serving people alone, but serving people through serving God wherever you are. I'm going to finish with a song called What Gift of Grace?